and welcome to helicopter training videos. In this short video, we're going to talk about hover training drills and exercises. This is a short clip from episode two of the helicopter training podcast, How to Hover a Helicopter. And you can find that full episode in the description or on our YouTube channel's podcast tab. So next, let's talk about some training exercises and drills to help get you up to those standards. First of all, I'd say most students average about 10 hours to achieve a really solid and stable hover. You know, some get it sooner, especially if they've got experience with heavy machinery, flight sims, or even just great natural skill, I guess. But others take 15, 20, or even more hours. It really depends on a lot. I mean, there's wind during the training flights, the instructor, the airframe, some are easier than others, how often you're flying, and really your mental attitude, you can really get inside your own head with this. So at the Robertson Instructor Standardization course I recently attended, there was a discussion about the significant number of accidents due to loss of control in a hover, even involving experienced pilots. So this is a skill we must remember that we can always improve on. Don't stop developing it just because you're past the solo phase. But let's first focus on the new pilot. With a brand, brand new pilot, before we even try hovering, as an instructor, I'd usually start them at altitude with forward airspeed, 60 to 70 knots. The aircraft's much more stable there. And then I'd get them to try the controls one at a time uh, before we even start on hover training. So let's just assume that's already been done and they've got a feel for each control in an easier flight profile. Hover training should begin in a safe environment. So we're talking about relatively low winds, facing into the wind if there is any, and then progressively move to more advanced drills and higher wind speeds. A higher hover altitude is uh, often used early on to give the students and the instructors a bit more time to react. I would also suggest hover work over a smooth, hard surface rather than grass or sod. Just in case you accidentally do make ground contact, you don't want the skids or the tail skid or stinger to catch like it did in this incident where the tail stinger caught and dug in. And again, a reminder, frustration in hover training is common. So it's important to recognize when a student has reached their kind of useful training limit and either the instructor takes the controls to give them a break or maybe move on to a different maneuver such as, you know, pattern work, flying around the pattern or uh, pickups and set downs, at least for a bit. When first learning to hover, it's really useful to work on one control at a time in what's called control isolation. And say the student takes just the pedals and the instructor takes the collective and cyclic. That way the student can really focus on just one control without the complexities and the interactions of all three control inputs. They can just fill out one control at a time. It's really, really important that both pilots agree on who's responsible for what control and speak up if they're unsure to ensure a positive exchange of controls as it's called there should be three stages of exchange so for example the instructor says you have the pedals i have the collective and the cyclic the student then brings their feet up into position onto the pedals with light pressure on the pedals and when they're ready the student then says as the second stage I have the pedals. As the third stage, the instructor looks to confirm that the student has their feet in place and then says, you have the pedals. That's the third stage as they slowly take their feet off the pedals as the instructor slowly takes their feet off the pedals. When first learning any maneuver, you can expect the instructor to be very close on the controls for safety. But if you're finding they're interfering with your free movement of controls, if you're feeling like you're heating up against the feet or hands, you can always ask, you know, is that you I'm feeling on the pedals or the controls? Or is that is that normal? And whatever you do, never just let go or give up on a control. Always use a positive exchange of controls. When first learning to fly a helicopter, we often start with control isolation. Like I said, just or just the pedals. The instructor would demonstrate good foot position, show you how to keep your heels on the floor, and adjust pressure on the pedals using just the balls of your feet. Another good thing for the instructor to demonstrate to a student is that typically the power pedal, which would be the left pedal in a counterclockwise system like the R22, will be further forward than the right pedal in a hover. 
as the hover is like a high power setting and requires more anti-torque thrust. So don't try to fly the helicopter straight in a hover by leveling the pedals. And to be honest, don't look down at all. Just look outside at least 50 feet ahead and fix any movement of the nose as needed, regardless of the pedal position. The instructor should also demonstrate or remind the student that a counterclockwise helicopter like the 22 will naturally want to turn to the right and you'll need to hold left pedal pressure just to hold heading. And so to turn right, you're only really giving up left pedal pressure. You're not really pushing a bunch of right pedal. You're really uh, just letting the torque reaction turn the helicopter to the right. And remember, the pedals are linked and they move as a pair. I usually start students on the pedals while I hover the helicopter along a straight line using the cyclic and collective. I ask the student just to hold our heading along the line. You know, imagine we're on a train following the tracks, which would be the yellow line in front of us. In our heliport, we've got some curved lines and that allows us to follow with some left and right turns. And then once they've got the hang of that, I will move on to a stationary hover and I will demonstrate a complete 360 degree turn and I'll stop at every 90 degrees. I'll also point out how wind might be affecting each position and how different the amount of power pedal is needed to hold each position and to make those turns. I always, always clear my tail before turning and that's an important primacy to show the student. Here's a quick video of an R44 that unfortunately uh, hit uh, hit the hanger as they made a pedal turn. So don't be like Charlie in this video clip. Always, always clear the tail before pedal turns. So then we practice 90 degree turns and 360 degree turns in both directions. And we're trying to stop within 10 degrees. I'd also notice how the counterclockwise helicopter may try to race ahead with the right turns. And we'll have to add left pedal pressure to control the, the turn rate. But as we go, if we've got any kind of wind, this will this will change depending on the wind direction. And we may end up having to put opposite pedal in uh, to control the turn rate. I then take back all three controls and demonstrate there's a torque your relationship. I get kind of lazy on the pedals, making no correction as I raise the collective. And I show that there's a right yaw and lowering the collective. I show that there's a left yaw because of the torque reaction in a counterclockwise rotor system. And then as the instructor, whenever I make these kind of demonstrations, it's really important to preface it with the word generally. And you've probably heard me say this a few times in this podcast. Generally, it does ABC. If, uh, if you don't do that, the one time you try to demonstrate something, there's going to be a freak wind or something like that that's going to turn the helicopter opposite to what you told them it would do. It's also important to not get too locked into what you expect the helicopter to do. And to remember, use the pedals as needed to control the heading. I then give just the pedals to the student and ask them to closely follow along with the collective in the left hand so they can feel the changes in torque. And I ask them to keep the nose facing the line as I increase and decrease the torque. Usually the student finds it somewhat tricky to start with, but generally makes pretty good uh, progress at this point. So I often move on to the collective. I make sure I have all three controls back and then I ask the student to focus along with following the collective movements as I hover along and change the height with the collective. I point out that they may need a, a bit of constant up pressure to hold the collective where it is as the collective may try to droop and how small the movements are. I also point out partly due to inertia there's a slight delay between the input and the results. I also show that in a hover an up or down collective movement generally makes a slight change in height and then we stabilize again due to the changes in ground effects. So we may need to make another input if we want to go higher or lower. So it's not really an on off switch or an up down switch. It's more of a add more, add less, and then adjust as necessary. I then go back to control isolation and give the student, you know, just the collective reminding them to keep most or if not all of the hand off the throttle to allow the throttle to work. They may tense up a little bit, so I want to make sure the throttle can move freely. I then get them to move us up and down as I control the hover position and the heading with the cyclic and pedals. And maybe I'll be driving us along a straight line. 
Again, the students usually make pretty good progress with this, and so I often move straight on to the next stage. Next, I give the student both the collective and the pedals while I have the cyclic as the instructor. So now they must add the torque reaction to their workload. As always, during this level of training, as the instructor, I'm relatively close to the pedals and collective to make sure they don't push the wrong pedal or dump the collective or just make overly large inputs. This is often where I might start to see a sense of frustration in a student, especially if there's any kind of wind affecting the hover. As the instructor, I'm always ready to take all three controls before they get too frustrated. Even if they're struggling a little bit here, I still like to move on and give them at least a taste of the cyclic at this point. Like I said, even if there's still you know, obviously quite a bit of work left to do with the collective and pedal training, the cyclic control is by far the most challenging, dangerous, and to me at least, the most fun part of hover training. I say fun because it often feels and looks like someone trying to ride a bucking bronco. Again, having a slightly higher hover is essential for safety and reminding the student, A, this is the most frustrating part, and B, do not let go of the controls until the instructor has them, no matter how scary it's feeling. I first like to take all three controls and get the student to follow along, really closely focusing on the cyclic whilst looking outside at the horizon. I need them to sense how small those inputs are and how there is a slight delay in the outcome and how looking out to the horizon will definitely help identify those changes in attitude that you need to fix with the cyclic input. Treat the whole windshield and the horizon as like a big attitude indicator to help identify and fix unwanted changes to the attitude of the aircraft. And that's what the cyclic does. It's also good to demonstrate and remind students that due to the inertia of the aircraft, there is this delay between input and the desired result. And for most cyclic inputs, there is two stages. There's the initial input to either start or stop the drift. And then there's a second cyclic adjustment to stabilize the new state. Tricky, I know. I then start a stabilized but slightly brisk hover taxi forward about five feet above the ground before I give the student the cyclic. This is to avoid much of the pendulum effect and tail rotor pedal adjustments, etc., that go into going from stationary hover to forward hover taxi. And then we see how far we get. And as any of you who've learned to hover will know, this 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 can be an interesting part of your training and it just needs repetition you just need to feel the helicopter out and understand the relationship between the cyclic and the desired attitude and movement of the aircraft and as they get better at that i start to give them all three controls often the pedals get forgotten at this stage they're really focusing on the collective or probably more focusing on the cyclic and uh you know it's a lot for a, a student to take all three controls and try to maintain a stabilized hover. That's not really what we're looking for at this point. We're just giving them exposure and starting to kind of build confidence and uh, build on from what we've done before. I never stay on hover training over and over until they just get it. I, I mix in other training like flying the pattern down to a go around. And of course we can do this away from the airport too. So we don't have to worry about you know traffic calls, radios, etc. cetera. Uh, I also work on pickups and set downs often again with control isolation and we keep working on hovering as we're also working on these other pieces and what I find is typically we're progressing on the pattern work the forward flight work and the hover work at the same time and we keep going around to a lower and slower go around and then just one session they do a pattern they make an approach and all of a sudden we're in a five foot brisk hover taxi and before they know it, they're hovering without even realizing or trying. Hello? Back controls? Yeah, the control loose on the pedals. So now the student's got the basics of hovering. We can start working on more deliberate and challenging drills in higher and higher winds if it's safe to do so. So here's some of the drills I like to do with students. First of all, once they've got the hang of all three controls in a hover, we start working on uh, basic pedal turns, all three controls, flying sideways and backwards, obviously a bit higher so that we clear our tail and slower when we go backwards. Another great one is if you have a helipad or some sort of rectangle or square, you can follow the edge. You can do that by facing into the wind or you can follow it 
by turning on each corner. Another thing you can do is you can keep the nose of the aircraft facing into the box and drive it around the edge. Uh, another thing you can do with this is you can add pickups and set downs on each corner. So if you're just driving along the lines, you get to a corner, you set down, pick up, turn 90 degrees, follow the line, set down, pick up. What I like about that particular drill is it's going to work on your not only your basic hover skills, but also your pickups and set downs in every wind direction. You can, of course, can also do this with a circle. You can either drive around the circle or you can have the aircraft facing into the wind and move around the circle. Or you can have your aircraft with the nose facing into the center of the circle and kind of work on uh, going around more of a sort of sideways and combined pedal turn. And of course, you can do that in both directions. Also, turns about the tail, which has a practical application of keeping your tail in a known safe spot. Another great one I really like are, are pirouettes. And you can start with a straight line and you just fly the helicopter nose into the direction of travel. Whilst maintaining that travel, you then start a 90 degree turn and you hold it and you're now moving sideways and uh, obviously clearing in the direction you're moving. And then you make another right degree turn, another right 90 degree turn. And now you're going backwards down the line and then another 90 degree turn. And you're trying to do this while making a continuous movement down the line. And of course you're fighting different wind directions. And then once you've done the basics with the 90 degree stops, then we can do in both directions. Then we can do a continuous turn pirouette where the aircraft is moving down the line, but the aircraft's in a controlled 360 degree pedal turn and then back the other way. You can really spice this up now by you doing the same thing around a box or around a circle, turning in both directions. Any other favorite drills I've missed, please let us know. I'm sure you have your own that you've either done or that you instruct with. So send those to us in the comments or in the feedback. And not for this video, but once the student gets to governor failure training, don't forget to do some hover work governor off. Maybe not pirouettes, but uh, make sure that any governor off work you do is in safe conditions. Uh, maybe do an approach to a, a landing area and then hover the aircraft back to parking. Obviously, assuming the winds are safe to do so, gusty conditions, this can be, uh, this can be a little bit dangerous. Okay, let's summarize some tips for learning or teaching hovering. This clip was just a small piece of what we cover in episode two of the helicopter training podcast, which was a deep dive on how to hover a helicopter. In the full episode, we walk through a few things like the controls in a hover, what each input does and how, hover aerodynamics, we cover some of the weird interrelated forces at play to help you understand why hovering is so difficult. We're also gonna look at the FAA ACS or Airman Certification Standards. That's the check ride requirements that we'll be looking at specifically for hovering. We'll also go into training exercises and drills to help you get to those standards and beyond, as well as tips for both students and instructors. So you can find the full episode right here on this YouTube channel under the podcast tab, or you can listen on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite podcast player is. Just search for Helicopter Training Podcast. And don't forget, you can start learning right now on the Helicopter Training Videos YouTube channel with video playlists covering things like ground school subjects, flight maneuvers, as well as following along with a student on every training flight from day one all the way through to check ride. If you haven't already, please click subscribe to get all the latest videos and help support this channel. And then finally, for more information, including articles and quizzes and resources, and how to support this volunteer project, check out our website, helicoptertrainingvideos.com. Thanks for watching. Fly safe.